Today's study is somewhat like a trial. There is judgment and testimony and witnesses and logical arguments. There's even, perhaps you could, you could make the case that there's even a closing argument in this lesson. Jesus was constantly on trial. From the beginning, as soon as he started talking, people were challenging him. And, of course, his life ended after a mock trial. People today still, right? People today still are wanting to put him on trial, putting the word of God on trial. They, everyone wants to question him. This chapter 5 now is, as we close out chapter 5, it's the continuation of uh, his defense regarding the implied accusation that he doesn't have authority to heal on the Sabbath, Uh, which is, yeah, you're laughing. It's, It's nonsensical, but here we are. By what authority do you do this? And of course, also he's on trial because supposedly he's blaspheming by making himself out to be the son of God. This is in the eyes of the Jews, in the eyes of the religious people. And so, Uh, he's going to make a case, and it's beautiful, it's glorious. We've got a a bit of text to read, so uh, follow along with me as uh, we pick up here in John 5, 25 through verses 47. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so, he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all those who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies of me, and I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. But the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. Verse 37, and the father who sent me, he has testified of me. You've neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him who sent me or him whom he sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not, you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another, and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? I have always enjoyed courtroom drama. I could list off all the different shows. You guys know a lot of them. I don't know. There's just something about it that I've 
always loved. From the first time that I ever saw 12 Angry Men, it's in the top list of movies for all time. And it's curious because it's, it's black and white. It's all in one room. It's just the, the deliberation of a jury. It's uh, it, this, uh, great acting in, in that original film. And, and of course, the storyline is, is, is awesome. I've reported for jury duty, but never had to go through with it. <laughs> it's like several times, you know, you show up and then they say, oh, yeah, we don't need you. Thanks for that. Never actually had to sit as a juror. But I, I suppose, I, I think I would probably like it. I like these kinds of things. I have, however, been a defendant. <laughs> One of the things that you find out right away as a defendant is that the judge has authority. Amen? I've, I've, been, I've sat in, in, in the courtroom and I've heard other defendants speak as though the judge doesn't have authority. And it's always just like, man, you are really stupid, right? It's just like, you realize the, 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 the judge has authority. Now, hopefully, the, the, the law itself is the authority that guides them. And I think that's most often the case, I would hope. Here we see that Jesus is the judge. All authority is his. He makes that case very clearly. He speaks of future judgment. He speaks of an hour, an hour that is coming, something yet in the future, over which he has complete and total authority. And this hour that is coming, and, 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 and as he lays it out, he talks about two different outcomes, two different resurrections. Now, what's assumed there is that death comes to all, which, of course, we understand, right? Comes to all. So that's... That's assumed, it's implied in what he's saying. But there will also be a resurrection of all. They will all, it says they will all hear his voice. And they will come forth. Just as he called Lazarus out of the tomb, he will call everyone out of the tomb unto Uh, the possible, two different resurrections, two different outcomes. The resurrection of life or the resurrection of judgment. And according to what he has just told us, what he has spoken to the crowd that's assembled there is there is a deciding factor in those two outcomes. Now in the text, he calls it deeds, Good deeds or evil deeds. Deeds is, is, is implied there. He doesn't explain exactly what he means. He doesn't go on and present the entire doctrine of salvation. That's not really what he's doing right now. This whole discussion is to answer the accusation that he was breaking the law by healing on the Sabbath and that he had stated that God was his father, implying that he was equal with God. It is important, however, to take a minute to understand what he means by doing good and doing evil, especially in the light of what he has just said. It determines the nature of our future resurrection. It's important. All of scripture and observable evidence makes it very clear that all men and women are corrupt. We all have evil deeds. 
In Psalm 14, 2 and 3, the psalmist writes, The Lord looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they've become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. As soon as you hear that, as soon as you read that, don't you want to just make an argument? Wait a second. This passage is also quoted in Romans chapter 3, where Paul makes the solid, airtight case of the universal sinfulness of man. Specifically, he comes to a conclusion in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us. And so the word of God tells us that because of this universal personal sin, we rightly deserve punishment for sin. And that punishment, according to the word of God, is death. Death is real. Physical death. It affects us all. I mean, you could try to escape it, right? People do. They try to escape it, but death comes for all of us. But then beyond the physical death, there is a spiritual death, which we understand is separation from God. Because of sin, we are separated from God. Not only will we die a physical death, but the condition of mankind is that we are separate from him because of that sin. So because of that, we need to understand that all of mankind is subject to this, what he calls the resurrection of judgment. Unless they're appointed to the resurrection of life. So every human being who's ever been born, they're all born subject to judgment. Unless we're appointed to the resurrection of life. Jesus says those who do good will enjoy the resurrection of life. The good that we do, that can be be misunderstood. And so that's why I'm taking a little bit of time to explain this. The, The good that we do is really only one thing. It's believing in Jesus. That is the only good work that will cause you to enjoy the resurrection of life. It's believing in him. This is the gospel. We're not saved from hell by doing good things. We do good things as Christians. We do good things. We ought to do good things, but we're not saved from eternal punishment by doing good. We're saved by trusting in Jesus. It's his good work. And our responsibility is to believe that. When we get to the next chapter, verse 29, he, he, Jesus is going to say just exactly that. He answered, this is uh, 629, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. That's it. That, that's what we need to do. We need to look to him. We need to trust in him. In Acts chapter 16, when, uh, the, if you remember the situation where the, Apostles were in prison in the Philippian jail and God broke them loose. And that night the the Philippian jailer was convicted and he asked, what should I do? What should I do to be saved? And their response was exactly the same thing. Acts 16, 31, they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. You and your household. Notice they, they didn't give them a long list of things. Hey, hey, go out and, you know, feed the poor and give blood. And, you know, do, they didn't give them a long list of other things to do. Now, we do good things as Christians. Again, that needs to be understood. But the only thing that's necessary to inherit eternal life is to trust in Jesus Christ. Amen? I hope you who are here today, you who are watching this online, that that you are trusting in him. That is how you receive that resurrection of life. Now, many people believe in the doctrine of 
what's called annihilationism. It's not a word you probably use commonly. But it's this idea that when people die, they simply cease to exist. People believe that. So, well, you know, we die, it's over. That's a lie. According to Jesus' words, that is a lie. No, you are an eternal soul. You will continue to live either with the Lord or apart from the Lord. In Matthew 25, 46, Jesus said it this way. He said, these will go away, the the ones that reject Christ, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And what happens to us in the afterlife is inextricably bound to what we do in this life, here and now. Our faith or our rejection in Jesus leads to either life with him forever or eternal separation. Now, again, he's not giving us all the details of these things here. Rather, he's claiming that he has authority over all of this. He's the judge. He has has authority over life. He has authority over all judgment. And he, in saying this, he knows. He knows he's not, he's not smoothing things over here with these guys. Every statement that he makes is is making it worse as far as they're concerned. But in verse 30, he he, he again, we looked at this last week, the, the idea that he's united with the God in all these different ways. He's united with him in judgment, which we talked about last week, but he he says it in essence again. I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. he's, He's not operating independently of God the Father. He's operating in unity with God the Father and with God the Spirit. He's repeating this idea that his judgment is in harmony with the Father's will. Now, like an attorney, again, this is, this is where I think it really gets interesting. He, he's going to call witnesses. He's going to bring up witnesses. He's arguing. He's making a case. Now, the law stated, the Jews would know this, the law stated that there must be more than one witness to convict somebody. If he's, when he says in verse 31, if I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. Now, that's kind of an odd statement because we, we know that his testimony is true. But what he's saying is that it's not admissible as evidence according to the law. In other words, you, you can't just take one person's word for it. There needs to be corroborating evidence. The the Jews would understand that. We, of course, understand that just in in our criminal justice system. There needs to be some evidence presented. And it can't just be, you know, the defendant can't just say, well, I'm innocent. He says, there is another, verse 32, there's another who testifies about me. And he's going to go on. There's three or four witnesses that he brings up, depending on how you interpret this. He's going to bring up John the Baptist. I called John the Baptist to the stand, although he's dead, so he can't speak. He calls his miracles to the stand. The word of the Father, both audibly and in the scriptures. One by one, he's going to make a case, presenting, again, this is evidence for his authority to do the things that he's doing and to say the things that he's saying. And, and he has just laid it out here. It's, it's not just, hey, I can heal on the Sabbath because of this. It's like, I have authority over your life. I have authority over your eternal future. Now, he brings up John. Initially, John was seen with great interest by 
by the crowds, by everyone. They were going out, it says. They were going out to listen to him. They, they thought, oh, we've got a prophet. There had been a, a long age of no prophets in Israel. And all of a sudden, John shows up and, and he's preaching. He's preaching fiery words of God. And people went out to hear him. Look at Mark 1, 5. It says, all the country of Judea was going out to him and all the people of Jerusalem and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River confessing their sins. Now, we, need to, we understand, right? Not everyone, but it's, a lot of people were going to the point where it seemed like everyone was going. John had a huge crowd. He had a huge ministry. And it was effective. They were being baptized by him. They were confessing their sins. What a great time of renewal that must have been. Man, I'd like to see that in our day, wouldn't you? Like a whole cities coming out to hear the word of God being proclaimed. People being called to repentance and actually responding. Oh. But again, John made it clear Right, We went over this earlier. John made it clear that his was a fading ministry. The crowd that he had, he was handing over. He was preparing the way for Jesus. He was preaching repentance. Repent of your sin and get ready because Messiah is here. That was his ministry. And here's, here's how his ministry was described in Mark 1.3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Get to Jesus. Really get, let your heart be broken. Here comes the Messiah. He's coming to save you. In Mark 1, 7 and 8, it says he was preaching. He was preaching and saying, after me, one is coming who is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is his ministry. It's all about Jesus. You went, and this is his point. You went out to hear John. You guys were enamored with John for a while. John's testimony is all about Jesus. John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, The next day he saw Jesus coming to him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. <laughs> There's your Messiah. This is the witness of John. And the witness of John, to just be summarized, look at Jesus, there he is. Right, get ready. Right, initially it was get ready, repent of your sins, be brokenhearted over your sins. Here comes the way of salvation. The Lamb of God, there he is. All of John's words and ministry were to point to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Now, normally in a courtroom trial, when an otherwise credible witness is brought forward, the prosecution immediately attempts, immediately attempts to impeach the witness by calling into question their integrity. Right? Cross-examination. They want to catch them in some lie or bring up something. Oh, you know, let's go back and talk about something that you previously did. So they want to make, you know, put holes in the, in the testimony by somehow declaring that the witness isn't worthy of being trusted or being listened to. They want to catch them in a lie. John's words were spoken in public. His, his witness, there's no arguing with his witness. Though, though he's not present there to be cross-examined, everyone knows what John's ministry was. His testimony stands because it's public. Everyone knows. It's therefore admissible. Next, Jesus brings... Up the idea of the works themselves, the miracles, his works or deeds, whatever you want to call them. 
These aren't, these aren't the common things that he did. Of course he did common things. These are the uncommon things that he did. And they speak for themselves, don't they? I mean, when we read them and those who witnessed them, they kind of speak for themselves. Remember the story of Nicodemus in John chapter 3? We went over that earlier. He, in his dialogue with Jesus, he, he brings up the idea that the religious leaders have already recognized Jesus' miracles as a demonstration of his unity with God. Look at John 3, 2. It says, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you've come from God as a teacher. No one can do the signs that you do unless God's with him. Like that, that's, They already understand that. You're doing incredible things, and we recognize that. Notice again, he's not talking about just himself. There's a we there. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the other leaders. They've been talking about this. How's this guy doing this? It's the power of God. There's no other explanation. Now, Jesus says that this testimony is greater than John's testimony. The miracles are empirical evidence of the power of God. And, And you need to know this. This is so important. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, they never question the miracles. Only the power behind them. They never claim, you'll you'll never read, that they claim that they're tricks or illusions. Again, because they're done in public. It's one of the things, people, people today, skeptics today, they have the luxury of being removed. And and so they can say, well, you know, I don't think that really happened. It's like, well, based on what evidence? Like, where are the... Where are the newspaper articles of the day, right? Where, where's the testimony of the skeptics of the day? They don't exist. There aren't any. I think it's one of the really interesting aspects uh, of the miracles. No one argued about them as to whether or not they were actual miracles. The man that was just healed earlier that kind of caused this whole dialogue, right? He had been in that condition for 38 years. And we might think, man, it's so, why didn't God heal him before that? Why, why did he have to be in that condition for so long? Well, we don't know all the answer to that. But you know what? It does establish something. And that is that everyone knew who he was. Everyone in Jerusalem knew this guy. He'd been there for 38 years. Probably everyone who had gone up to the temple had seen him. It was complete. It was an established fact that this guy couldn't move. He couldn't get up and help himself. And so when he was healed, there could be no argument. It was completely established. It would be different if he was like new in town. Right? If he was, and you guys know what it's like when you pass somebody who's, you know, they're on the side of the road and they got the sign and maybe they got a walker or something. And it's like, all right, I've heard enough and seen enough of those stories. A lot of times those guys, they, you know, their car is parked around the corner, you know, and when they're ready to go, they just pack it up and move on. They're pretenders. But there's no, there's this, this is not the case because of the time 38 years. There are about 37 different miracles recorded in the New Testament that Jesus performed during his three and a half year public ministry. Only, it's kind of amazing, isn't it? There's really only about 37, depending on how you count them. Now, we know that he did many more miracles than that. In John 20, verse 30, it tells us, There were many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which were not written in the book. But there were sufficient miracles. I mean, there was a great number of things that he did. And and there were enough miracles affecting enough people that likely everyone in Israel would have known about him. 
Not only were there enough miracles, they were miracles of incredible variety. Great in number, great in variety. He healed many different types of physical ailments. He healed people from incurable diseases like leprosy, paralysis, blindness, deafness, and more. He delivered people from demonic possession, performed miracles in nature, and even raised the dead. And even within those miracles, there was a lot of variety within those. He raised Jairus' daughter who had just died. That's in Matthew chapter 9. He, he raised the widow of Nain's son who was in a coffin in Luke chapter 7. So someone who had just died, someone who had been dead a little while, and then, of course, Lazarus who had been in the tomb for four days. Jesus showed his control over all three of these different stages of death. Those who had just died, those who were going to be buried, and those who had already been in the tomb. He was able to heal, sometimes with a touch, sometimes with a word. Sometimes near, sometimes over significant distance. Demonstrating that he had authority over time and space. He was Lord in his in his miracles, he demonstrated Lord being Lord of, of the natural as well as the supernatural, although to him, it's all the same. He did his miracles publicly, sometimes in a crowd, right? sometimes in a large crowd. He wasn't ever, it wasn't just like, oh, we can only do miracles in one place. No, he did them all over the place. All over the place at different times. Like the, he didn't need an organ playing in the background. Isn't it funny how, you know, the healers, they've got to have things set up just right. Right? They've got to have a stadium or, you know, a thing. They've got to have a stage. Some of them got to have that earpiece. <laughs> no, Jesus just demonstrated he, he could... He could heal in all these different ways. He could do miracles in all these different ways. He healed before Jews. He healed before Gentiles. All of his miracles were done for the good of others. They were never done to increase his celebrity or to generate income. When Peter preached so powerfully at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, he appeals to the fact that everyone, everyone was aware of Jesus' miracles. He says this, Acts 2.22. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. What confidence he's speaking with there, isn't it? It's, I, love, I love it. When Peter's filled with the Holy Spirit, he's a changed man. And here he is. He, he's appealing to what they know. You guys all know this. There's no argument. And, and again, this is a, a, another really interesting thing for the skeptic. The crowds don't begin to shout, what, what are you talking about? Right? That's not what happens. There's no argument. Rather, they respond by being convicted. They respond by saying, what should we do? Because he brings it. He says, Jesus did all these miracles. And this is testimony that God was with him and you killed him. And the response is, what should we do? It's conviction. It's utter conviction because they've all seen it. Again, these are things that were done in public. And 3,000, 3,000 repented on that day. <laughs> ah, that's awesome. Love to have been there. The miracles are indeed a witness 
to his authority. And they are undeniable. Right? It's only, it's only smarty pants guys today that can say, oh, you know, I don't believe in that. No one, no one in the day, there was no argument made. They recognized this. And everyone knew. The next witness he brings up, again, we could just say he's calling the word of the Father as a witness. The word of the Father. Now, he doesn't go into great detail here, but we know that God the Father did speak audibly. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record that at Jesus' baptism, God spoke audibly, testifying to the fact that this was his son. Matthew 3, 16 through 17. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I have no idea what that sounded like. But it's incredible. It's interesting also that the, not only is the Father represented there, but also the Holy Spirit symbolically manifest in that scene, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together. This is also the testimony of the Father on the Mount of Transfiguration in Luke chapter 9. Now this wasn't so much public, just a handful of the disciples were there, but a voice came out of the cloud. This is Luke 9.35. A voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my Son, my chosen one. Listen to him. I've always loved that one in particular because God interrupts Peter. Peter's being kind of goofy in that moment. God kind of interrupts him. He says, just be quiet. Listen to my son. Just listen to him. Now, Jesus says, he, he kind of seems like he's, he, he's contradicting himself, although we understand that he's not. He says in verse 37, you've neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. And so it's like, well, well, he actually has spoken. What he's saying is God's spoken, but you didn't hear. You didn't hear him. You didn't see him. And the reason why is because you don't believe him. You don't believe his word. Again, he's talking to the religious guys, the ones who, who ought to be, right? They, they ought to be believers. They know the word, but they don't believe the word. They don't believe him or the word. It's possible to know the word of God technically and yet have no saving relationship with him. I think this ought to be a great fear that all of us have that we could know the word of God, that we could hear the word of God, but never really have a relationship with him. I've met people like this. Have you? I've heard, I have met guys who know the Bible much better than I do, who can cite chapter and verse, who have like incredible memory. I don't have that great of a memory, but I've met people that do. They have exceptionally sharp brains who know the texts of the Bible but they've missed the entire point of it because they haven't put faith in Christ. And I think this is what he's calling out in these guys. Look at verses 39 through 40. He says, you search the scriptures because you think in them that in them you have eternal life. It is these who testify about me and you're unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. The Old Testament scriptures bear witness to Jesus. This is the word of God. So so God has spoken audibly, but God has spoken in his word throughout all of history. And the Old Testament talks about Jesus. Yet the people who received the word, the people who preserved the word, were blind to their own Messiah. They know the word of God yet they do not know the God of the word. Why? They simply refuse to believe. Numbers 14, verse 11, 
The Lord said to Moses, how long? How long will this people spurn me? How long will they not believe in me, despite all the signs which I have performed in their midst? God did so many things. He has done so many things throughout history, intervening in the course of human affairs, specifically, of course, with the nation of Israel. And yet, they spurn him in unbelief, refusing to trust him. Remember after Jesus was raised from the dead? After he was raised from the dead, initially the disciples would not believe. He had been telling them, right? If you read through the Gospels, you'll see that Jesus was constantly preparing them for what was to come. He told them over and over and over again about what was going to happen. They had heard the word from him about what was going to happen. But when the women came on that morning, and they said, oh, we have seen him, right? They're eyewitnesses. We have seen him. The Lord's alive. Luke 24, 11 says, but these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. These are guys that walked with Jesus and saw all these miracles. But this was too much. It's one thing to have the word of God, even to know it but it must be united with faith to be really understood. You've, you've, you've got to believe it. Jesus convicts these men. Look at verse 40. You are unwilling to come to me. You're unwilling to come to me. Why? Why? What's going to be required in them coming to him? Humility. Humility, an acknowledgement of their need. You're unwilling to come to me. And rather than coming to him so that they might have life, they will. Unless they repent, they will be judged for their rejection of him. Again, ultimately that's what decides the fate of humanity. Whether or not you believe in Christ, whether or not you're willing to come to him. Jesus points out how different he is from them. They suppose that he needs their honor, right? They're, they think they're important guys and that somehow he's looking for their, them to, to honor him. He knows, he knows he's not going to get it from them because they do not have God's love in them. I mean, that's exactly what he says. You don't. You guys talk about God. Again, you know the word. You've got this whole religion but you don't actually love God. And because you don't love God, you don't have his love in you. And of course, you know internally they've got to process this because already they've begun to think about, we've got to kill this guy. So beyond his words, they have the internal witness and the guilt of their own, the things that they're thinking about. No, you don't have the love of God in you. You're plotting murder even now. It's interesting as he talks about this, who they will honor. He says, you'll receive someone who comes in his own name. You'll receive someone who thinks that they're a celebrity or you know, it was all about themselves. You'll receive that guy. And then he says, you guys receive glory from one another. Oh, you love this, don't you? And I'll tell you, you would think 2,000 years later, we'd be living in a different world, but it's exactly the same. We, we for whatever reason, we love guys who are self-congratulatory, that make a big deal of themselves. I'm not talking about us, but the, the culture. And we see this in the culture. We see it amongst the false teachers, even. They come in their own name. And they have this same kind of celebrity culture. Hey, congratulate me. So the celebrity culture is so weird, isn't it? It's like, it's like they just get together and it's like, hey, it's your turn to get an award. I'm going to give you an award. And then next week you can give me an award. 
Let's keep celebrating one another. It's like this little weird circle of celebration of what we do because it's so wonderful, though it benefits no one. These guys are like that. This is what they do. They, they're the important people. And they celebrate one another. It's exactly the same. And I'll tell you what, this unfortunately has affected the church. The celebrity culture has affected the church. We have to be really careful of that. Jesus did not receive glory from men. He receives glory from God. And when we believe in him, we're simply believing in what God has said. We're believing in God's word. We're believing in God's witness. And then this is what I would call maybe the closing, his close, which is kind of calling a surprise witness. He brings up Moses. Now, we know he's talking to Jews. He's talking to the religious leaders. They venerate Moses. Moses is everything to them. And now he's bringing up Moses as a witness to himself. Oh, you know, this just infuriated them. How, how dare you? His final witness is Moses. In Deuteronomy 11.18, it says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen. You shall listen to him. Now that's just one example of the words recorded by Moses that point to Jesus. But there's, there's tons of them. And, and though there's no reference given as to exactly what he's talking about in the Moses testifying about Christ, there are words and there are types and examples and miracles and all kinds of things in the Old Testament that point to Christ. When you look at the Old Testament in light of Jesus, you begin to see him everywhere. He was represented in Moses as a type of deliverer. And, and, and not just Moses, but, you know, every deliverer is a type of Christ. He was seen in the Passover. Oh, my goodness, if you've ever gone through that study, Jesus is seen in the Passover. He's seen in the miraculous manna, the bread of life. He's seen in the water from a rock, the, 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 the water of life. He's in all of those things. In John chapter 3, we read about the, 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 the story in Numbers where, if you recall, the people were dying of these serpent bites. And God told Moses to, to make a, a standard and to put on the standard this, this bronze serpent. He says, you hold that up, and when anyone looks to it, they'll be healed. It's a weird story. We went through it a few weeks ago. It's kind of a strange story. Why is it there? Why did God choose to do it that way? Because it was a picture of the cross. The serpent on the standard was the image of Jesus having the sins of the world pour, poured out upon him. And all people had to do was look to him. I mean, the, the, test, the Old Testament is filled with these pictures. And all of them combined give us the testimony that Jesus is God. That Jesus is the Messiah. All, all of the Old Testament combined tells one story, doesn't it? It's the story of salvation. It's a story of fallen mankind and God intervening and pointing to what he will do in Jesus. He says, these things speak of me. They all give combined testimony to Jesus' identity as God. 
And they point to him as having authority over life and death. He is the author of life and salvation and the life to come. Are you putting your faith and trust in him? Have you put your faith and trust in him? I hope you have. You really don't have any other options, right? The the other option is that you will die, right? Now, we could get into the doctrine of the rapture, but that's not for today. But should the Lord not come and rapture the church in your lifetime, you will die. And, and based on what you believe today and what you believe before you die, you're either going to enjoy the resurrection of life, which, by the way, if you're Christians, you're already enjoying that, right? You have eternal life, the Bible tells us, as we put our faith and trust in him. But if you haven't done that, if you're in the condition where you just keep putting that off, you're, you're being foolish, And not because I say so, but because of what God has testified to. He wants to give you eternal life, and you can have it if you look to Jesus. We're going to have communion in a few minutes, and it's another another opportunity to do exactly that, to look to him. To look to him, to look to what he has done, the good work that he has done. And the good work is this that he came and gave his life in your place. He died a death that you deserve to die. On the cross, the sin of humanity was poured out upon him, and he took it. He took it willingly because he loves you. So as we have communion, we're just remembering that. We're remembering that he took our sins. His body broken for us, his blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. And as we look to him, we're healed. As we look to him, we're forgiven. As we look to him, he grants us eternal life. This is the gospel. This is the testimony of God. Again, it's not just the testimony of God in the New Testament. It's the testimony of God going back to the garden where he promised to send a savior. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the words of Christ in this passage. Jesus, we thank you for what you have done for us. God, I pray that it would just wash over us that the truth of the gospel, the truth of the hope that we have, it's not based in some fairy tale or some fantasy as some suppose. It's based in evidence. We trust you based in the truth of your word. And all of us could, we could all testify. We could all be called to the stand. I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. I have known your salvation. I have known your forgiveness. God, today, this morning, we want to say thank you. We want to say thank you for what you've done. As we come to the table this morning, We're coming acknowledging you. We're coming in humble gratitude. We're coming in confession. We're coming in hope. That we have eternal life, the eternal life that you promised and that you have authority to grant. Thank you, Jesus. We pray these things in your precious name.